We are discussing radiative and non radiative uh, relaxation pathways of uh, semiconductor and nanocrystals. As we said, there is a vast body of literature on this and there are differing opinions as well. So, in the limited uh, scope of this course, we will not be able to discuss everything that I leave to uh, the interest of few people. But what we are discussing now is one single paper published in ACS Nano to the in 2011 uh, by uh, Wies and her group, where they had uh, taken a uh, very rigorous uh, approach towards understanding these uh, rate constants or amplitudes also obtained in time resolved studies of cadmium selenide nanocrystals in particular. Now, what I would suggest is that one should try and see uh, go through the papers that I have cited her paper. Because if you do that, you will see that there have been people who have supported this approach, there have been people who have opposed this approach. So, we are talking about uh, science that is evolving now not science that is established 100 years ago. So, uh, to be honest the jury is out, but the reason why we still discuss this paper is that this is a I would say it is a little bold approach, but a thorough approach nevertheless to try to understand the temporal parameters obtained in ultrafast studies. So, we have discussed this already in the previous module, what they did is they worked with uh, 5 nanometer cadmium selenide uh, particles. They did work with uh, little bigger particles as well uh, just to verify whether uh, what it whatever they say is applicable for another set or not and it turned out that they were, that they were applicable. This as we discussed is the absorption spectrum and we have already talked about what these bands mean. This is the most prominent uh, band edge absorption that we get and the photoluminescence that we get is more or less mirror image of the band edge absorption quantum yield is only 5 percent. And then the unique approach of this paper is that when we talked about earlier uh, about this uh, data fitting and all we had said that if you use a sufficient number of exponentials you can fit even an elephant. So, here they have uh, used a large number of exponential functions and as we will see they have tried to make use of all the time constants that they get make sense of all the time constants that they get. So, uh, First of all, they performed a, an ultra fast experiment. You can see the full scale here is about a nanosecond, and from there, they obtained three time constants 0.73 picosecond, 4.5 picosecond, and 48 picosecond. And from TCSPC experiments, they obtained 1.4 nanosecond, 13 nanosecond, 45 nanosecond. Point to note is that there are there has been a lot of work on uh, semiconductor nanocrystals where people have done only TCSPC and have happily uh, lived with these three time constants. But as is very obvious in this work, it is not enough to do just TCSPC. One should look at ultra fast time scales as well, because as you see the uh, photoluminescence is decayed to about 10 percent of what it was at the beginning in a matter of a nanosecond. In 500 picosecond, it goes down to maybe 20 percent. So, there is a very, very prominent ultra fast component that one cannot neglect. Of course, when you look at uh, photoluminescence, perhaps it is the nanosecond components that dominate at least in the steady state spectrum, because uh, PL that gets over in tens and uh, hundreds of uh, picosecond do not contribute sufficiently. If you remember, contribution to steady state intensity is AI tau i, where AI is the normalized amplitude. So, it is not only AI tau i also contributes. So, if you have two tau i's one is 10 picosecond and one is 100 nanosecond that itself is a factor of 100,000 by 10, 10,000 right. And let us say, so let us say we have a picosecond component of uh, so 90 percent, 90 percent of the decay is in 10 picosecond and uh, well time constant is 10 picosecond amplitude is 0.9. What is uh, amplitude multiplied by tau here? 0.9 into 10 picosecond. Okay. So, to bring everything to picosecond. So, that is 0.9 multiplied by 10, uh, 9 okay. and uh, 10 percent 0.1 multiplied by 100 nanosecond. How much is that? 10 nanosecond that is 10 nanosecond, 10,000 picosecond. So, 10,000 divided by 9 is how much? 
let us say 10,000 divided by 10 is 1000. So, contribution of the long component will actually be 1000 times that of the ultra short component in the steady state spectrum, even though its amplitude is only 10 percent. You can have uh, other examples where you can tweak these numbers and see that uh, this thing actually holds, okay. but we digress a little bit. So, three time constants from uh, ultra fast experiment, three time constants from the TCSPC experiment and then they had done a visible transient absorption as well in picosecond time scale as well as nanosecond time scale. And from there they got these time constants, the only difference was 1.4 and 0 0.7. This was the only component that was different, otherwise more or less everything was same and that is remarkable. And that is why they got encouraged to probe this further. And as you see this 0 0.73 picosecond component does not even show up in uh, transient absorption using visible probe. It does have indications of showing up when the probe is NIR. I think we have discussed all this in the previous module. In NIR, we see that uh, as one goes from probe wavelength of 900 nanometer to 1400 nanometer, decays get faster and faster and it is very clear that the long time constant decays are all tail matched. Long time decays are all tail matched. In short time, the difference is there. As you go to the radar side, you get the decays becoming faster. And when fitted just as such, this is the kind of data that we had shown you. This 4.7 becomes 2.5 but then that does not explain anything. In fact, what they also try to do is they try to use uh, things like stretched exponential model. But what they found is that even by using stretched exponential model, the number of terms does not decrease. So, stretched exponential model in this case does not teach us anything. That is why they um, embarked upon the analysis that we are discussing now. So, uh, another thing that was known from earlier work of Wies and co-workers as well as Klimov and co-workers is that if you look at this NIR probe transient absorption, uh, this is ascribed to bandage to higher energy state relaxation, well higher energy to bandage relaxation or rather I can say that this absorption is from bandage to higher energy. How does one go from bandage to higher energy? One thing is that electrons can go higher up, I mean electrons might have gone higher up. Uh, or might go higher up when you excite by the probe or the hole can keep going down or both can happen. Okay. So, what is it actually? To understand that, one thing that is known is uh, that this hi higher energy side is dominated by electrons, lower energy side is dominated by holes. That was established in the papers that I had shown. So, this seems to be mostly a hole contribution because it goes up there. So, what they did was they had done a global analysis, but uh, not really global analysis because they had fixed the lifetimes. They fixed the lifetimes because they already see a very good match between uh, PL and transient absorption data for 5 of the time constants. And this 0.73 picosecond time constant was also well resolved. That is why they fixed it, but this is one step that can be questioned. So, did uh, this uh, global analysis and this is what they got all these time constants 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and then they work with the amplitudes. They plotted the amplitudes and you get this kind of a plot. So, look at which one is C 1 out of these, you can see the color I hope. C 1 means the amplitude associated with uh, tau 1. Uh, this is also called uh, A 1 in later discussion. Okay. So, which one is C 1 out of these? This one right and see what happens to T 1, C 1, it is not there, it is 0 and then it goes up in the NIR range and goes to saturation. Why does that happen? Because this 0 0.73 is uh, associated with ultra fast hole relaxation. Remember as you go higher energy to lower energy side in the NIR domain, NIR probe domain, you get signal that is more and more uh, predominated by holes. What all things can happen? So, as you go from higher energy to lower energy side, it is dominated by holes, right. What all things can happen? First of all, and, and this is, it is important to uh, have this very clear because we will need it in the subsequent discussion. So, you have an electron and you have an hole, you have created an exciton. Now, first of all, they can recombine. 
right and uh, go back to the ground state. And that recombination is the only process that contributes to uh, emission of light. You can perhaps not have uh, non radiative recombinations also, but when a, an electron and hole recombines that is the only time when you get light out of the system that is is that clear. Other things can also happen you can have the electron going up the energy ladder you can have the hole going down which also uh, the hole going down means essentially increase in energy right. That can happen uh, independent of each other the electron can go up higher in energy irrespective of uh, the hole right or uh, let us put it this way this I think we will all understand electron can be say trapped or hole can be trapped independent of the other uh, carrier yeah. So, these are the different things that can happen in trapping process electron and hole one of these are uh, one of these is usually affected, but in recombination both are involved and that is the process that is uh, that gives you light remember this we will come back to this ok. So, this uh, 0.3 picosecond component is ascribed to ultra fast hole relaxation and we will see by the time we are done what that means. You understand what hole relaxation means it essentially means that initially the hole is in uh, one of these lower levels it floats up to the uh, highest level in conduction in uh, valence band that is hole relaxation. Electron relaxation means electron is in a higher energy level it sinks to the lowest band lowest uh, uh, energy level in the conduction band that is electron relaxation this is hole relaxation. So, this 0 0.3 picosecond is associated with ultra fast hole relaxation yeah why because in NIR in the lower energy side this 0 0.73 picosecond is observed to a greater extent and the lower energy side as is shown is dominated by hole relaxation all right. Then another important thing to remember and we said it earlier is that each component is really 1 by k r plus k n r every tau every time constant is equal to 1 by k r plus k n r. There can be a situation where for a particular component k r is much much larger than k n r. So, you can neglect k n r we can have cases and we will have a case at least where k n r is so much larger that uh, you can neglect k r, but those are special cases. The general case is that every component every tau is 1 by k r plus k n r this holds for everything not just nanoparticles. And this something this is something that somehow we have uh, already talked about this k n r can be associated with electron trapping hole trapping or the recombination right. And k r can be associated with radiative uh, electron hole recombination. So, but then how to make any sense of this now we will start discussion of this uh, uh, rather rigorous and sometimes and uh, possibly questionable uh, treatment of the amplitudes that this group had done. And I want to tell you by the time we are done uh, what you think of this analysis and when I say I want you to uh, tell me what you think of this analysis I do not mean I want you to tell me what I think of this analysis. You should feel free to say that this analysis is rubbish if you feel so. Right. So, this is what they did first of all they define well there is not much to define here it is quite straightforward the fraction of the total normalized amplitude of a given component that is accounted for by electron decay they defined to be eta n e equal to chi n e by chi n e plus chi n h where the chi's are the fraction of total population of electron and hole respectively in bandages that decay via C n it is important to understand this statement Do you understand what is what they are trying to say. What does n denote of C n what is n what is C normalized coefficient amplitude ok and uh, it has also been used as uh, a ok that might be a little misleading what is n what does n tell you which component you are working with. So, this 0 0.73 picosecond component is n equal to 1 component 
4.5 picosecond component for that n equal to 2, 4 or 48 picosecond n equal to 3 and so on and so forth. Okay. So, this subscript of the uh, taus that are given at the top, the subscripts are the n. All right. Now, understand what they are saying. Chi n e and chi n h are the fractions of total population of electrons and holes. E for electron, H for hole in the bandages. So, they are in this study we completely neglect things that are not in the bandage for now, at least in the initial definition that decay via n. Right? So, you have uh, say Avogadro number of uh, electron, Avogadro number of hole. Right? Different electron hole pairs will uh, do different things. Right? We can only work with statistics, we can only work with fractions that uh, decay you by the by this component or that, that is all they are saying. And eta n e is given by chi n e divided by chi n e plus chi n h that is very straightforward. And of course, then the fraction attributed to whole decay would be 1 minus eta n e, the two etas have to add up to 1. Clear? What is eta? It is the fraction of the total normalized amplitude that is accounted for by uh, electron or hole depending on what subscript you are using. Are we clear? Then they started trying to simplify this problem. So, what happens for, uh, so one more parameter is there which we have not really talked about here and that is wavelength. They are doing transient absorption all right, so the different wavelengths are there. So, is there, can you think of a wavelength where there is no contribution from either electron or hole? If you can do that, then the problem becomes a little simpler. Can you think of a wavelength from what we have seen already, probe wavelength, where uh, the hole does not contribute? I will make things easy. Yeah? Higher energy side, of course. Actually, uh, let us remind ourselves where do we see the hole dynamics very prominently? In NIR, right? So, if you just go to that visible transient absorption, there uh, we will reach a situation where hole dynamics is not even there. So, what they have done is they have taken this uh, position of absorption maximum right, or transient absorption minimum 572 nanometer that position they said there is no contribution from holes. Okay. So, a n v is equal to chi n e that is the starting point. They have defined this wavelength to be lambda v's. Okay. Of course, there is many other lambda v's, why 572, even 500 is lambda v's. But here they are defining, you can treat it as a proper name, not as a generic name. They are defining 572 nanometer to be lambda v's. Okay. So, a n v's is equal to chi n e. So, what they are saying is chi h, uh, chi n h equal to 0. For which n? For which n? For all n. All n 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for all the n's for probe wavelength 572 nanometer which is given the name lambda waves, there is no contribution of the whole that is what they are saying. And what is the basis of saying that? The whole dynamics is seen in this NIR. Okay. Then what they do is, in fact, you can now take this and any other wavelength, where you know what is the contribution of electron, what is the contribution of hole. So, just to keep the calculation uh, simple, they have looked for a wavelength, where there is 50-50 contribution from electron and hole. How does one find it? That is what we will learn now. Okay. But perhaps it is better if we take a break and uh, discuss this in the next module from here onwards.